Hello everybody, Timothy Bailey here from Project Learn with another video for us today. Today we're going to look at one of my favorite things, words, vocabulary words. And two specific things, we're going to look at uh, words that have a common and uncommon form of the word, and some words that have changed their meaning. Um, one of the things that makes English difficult, we know grammar is difficult, but vocabulary can be very tricky. It can be deceiving. Sometimes it looks a certain way and then it's not true. Uh, when we look at prefixes and suffixes, they don't always um, give us the information we want. So words are a fascinating part of any language. And we're going to look at some today. Let's start off with words with the common and uncommon uh, form. So here we're in a store, right? You can see the man here, right? Looks like it's probably a coffee shop, maybe a local coffee shop or like Starbucks or something like that. So here's the man here, the clerk. And then this woman here, we would call her the customer, right? Now we know the ER suffix, you can see it in bold here, usually tells us the person who is doing this. For example, a speaker is the person who's speaking, and a swimmer is the person who's swimming, etc. But what does this mean, custom? We know customs in some sense of the word, but we don't know it here in a store. What does it mean? And I thought about this one day when I was watching a, a TV show, and the person said, the TV show took place in a store, and the person said, thank you for your custom." This is not something we would usually say in America. I don't know if they, I was watching a British show. I don't know if they would still say that or not. But what does this mean like this custom? Well, if we look at dictionary.com, the first few are the understanding of custom that we normally think about. A habitual practice, right? Habits, a long established practice, right? For example, an American custom is to shake hands, right? A uh, Korean and Japanese custom is often to bow, right? We know that idea of custom, but look down here. Definition number eight, regular patronage of a particular shop or restaurant. So when the clerk said, thank you for your custom, this is what he was talking about. Thank you for shopping, we would say in today's English, right? So why am I bringing this up? Well, because when you look at the word, you, want, you might want to know. Well, what, what about this, right? What about this without the suffix telling us it's a person, right? This is where it comes from. Let's look at another example. So here, right, this man and woman obviously got married or are at least getting married. Right? What do we call the people? We call them husband and wife, but there's another word you may or may not know called a spouse. And they are both a spouse. She is his spouse and he is her spouse. Right? So then we might think, well, what's the noun right, for uh, being married or getting married that goes with spouse? Because usually we have these, right? The, the word for the person, the word for the activity. Well, there is an old word, espousal, right? Which is the marriage, right? Again, we don't use this today hardly anymore, but we do still use this, right? Okay, so espousal is the marriage, right? We just use spouse. And even that word, I think, is probably uh, sort of going away. Look at another example. Here's another clerk in a store, this woman, right? She is stocking the shelves. It looks like she's putting out soy sauce or something like that. I buy a lot of those sauces, so that's what it looks like. Another word for stocking the shelves, we might say, is she is replenishing the shelves. She's replenishing the merchandise to make it full again, to put out more, right? Again, here the prefix re. But if this means to do it again, to plenish again, right, this is just the continuous 
suffix ing, to plenish again. What does plenish mean? Right? Whoops, and I hit the wrong button. What does plenish mean? Well, if we go to the dictionary here. I thought we would just actually look at the dictionary page. Here it means to fill up or to stock, right? And it said, tells us here that this is mostly a Scottish use of the word. Right? However, what I thought was interesting is if you go down to the origin of plenish, right? A long time ago, Middle English, right? You can see that it does have a long history, even before Scotland, of filling up or stocking, right? So it's just that now they are mostly the ones who use it, okay? okay so to plenish. Let's look at another one. So here's a man relaxing, right, reading a book. When you're leaned back like this, in this chair or in anything, we say uh, that you are reclining, to recline, okay? In fact, we call this chair a recliner, right? So here we're talking about the chair, not the person. We wouldn't call him a recliner. We would say he is reclining. The chair is called a recliner. So again, what does it mean to cline again? Is this a word? Is this a verb by itself? Well, we can look at the dictionary again, right? It's always important to learn your dictionary, how it works. Now, the first two things here, one's from biology, one's from linguistics, right? These really don't tell us what we are thinking about when we think about that picture. But again, go down to the origin, right? So from Greek, which means to lean, right? And to lean means what that man was doing, like this, right? In the picture, he is leaning, he is clining. Again, we no longer use the word cline like this, but we still use recline, okay? A lot of our words that have a prefix like re, the main part, we may or may not use that anymore, but we still use the form of the word with the prefix or the suffix. So recline. Let's look at some words that have changed their meaning. So imagine you have a little bit of vacation. Uh, you want to take a trip. The virus is gone, whatever. Right? And you want to go to another country, right? China, India, Russia, right? We would say that you are going to go travel abroad, right? Abroad is a word we use today, means to another country. However, the original meaning was closer to this, right? This family or these uh, children and perhaps their mother or someone, right? Uh, they may be in another country, but they could just be close to their house, in their backyard, or on a trail at a park. The original meaning of abroad simply meant outdoors. If someone were to say, I'm going abroad, right, it's a nice day out, I'm going to go read abroad, they might just be saying, I'm going to go read outside, right? So abroad has changed to a very specific meaning, another country. Here's another one. What, it, what are these things? Good, they are meat, right? They are meat. So when we say meat now, typically we mean the flesh of an animal of some kind. Occasionally we will use it uh, to mean other things. For example, we might talk about the meat of this walnut, right? Or even the flesh of the walnut. So we're talking about the part that we actually eat. We might also say the meat of an argument, right? the important part. And I think that's easy to understand if you think about in the past, meat was very important. You might not always have meat, right? If we go to our dictionary, meat also used to mean, look at number, uh, where am I at, number four, solid 
food, right? Solid food. Meat and drink. Meat in the past originally meant any food we eat, any solid food that we eat was referred to as meat. Right? So you can see what was a very generic word for food now is just one kind of food, usually. Here's another good one. So let's look at the word awful. Right? This one has an interesting history. Right? Awful. Made up of two parts, aw and full. Full also means the same as some here. And we'll see that in a second. Right? Well, aw originally meant fear or dread. Something like this girl, right? She is afraid. She has fear. She has dread. Originally, she would be filled with awe, right? However, things changed, right? Uh, oh, full in some also meant to be full of something, to have a lot of whatever it is we're talking about here, awe, right? So originally, the meaning for this would have been something like uh, to have a lot of fear, such as this girl. Later, awe changed to be something closer to what this picture means, right? An experience of something wonderful, something awe-inspiring, we would say, right? So we've gone from bad to good, right? Awe became something marvelous, right? People, religious experiences are often experiences of awe, right? When you hear the awe, like this, right? However, the word changed again. Right? So it's an experience of wonder, right? Such as this picture. Then the two words sort of diverted, right? They took two different paths. Awful became like what you see in this picture. The woman feels awful. She feels ill. She feels horrible, bad. That is awful, right? So sort of back to this, only not necessarily about being afraid, just feeling bad. Awesome, however, became a good thing, right? To be full of awe in this sense, right? Became something wonderful, right? That was awesome. That was great. I feel awful. I feel bad. So you can see, even though these awe parts and these some and full had the same meanings, now awesome and awful are sort of at opposite ends, right? I hope that was helpful. English vocabulary can be very tricky. This first link here has uh, 10 very common words that have changed their meaning. The second list here is a long list of words, archaic words, old words we no longer use, but some of them do have forms that we use and the ideas are still there, right? Check them out. I hope this was helpful. Thank you uh, and have a great day.